This video is sponsored by Squarespace, the all-in-one platform to build your beautiful online presence and run your business. Hey, hey, Marcus House with you here, and today we are going to give you a rundown of all the Starship updates from Boca Chica, some interesting new information about Starlink and its newly tested communication via space lasers. We're going to talk a little about Rocket Lab's awesome new Photon spacecraft and a few interesting updates on NASA's space launch system. Okay, Neil, we can see you coming down the ladder now. So SpaceX has now completed two successful 150 metre hops with Starship SN6's flight following just four weeks after SN5's flight. Now because of these successes, Starship testing is preparing to enter the next phase and we're super excited about what is coming next. Starship SN8's tank section is right now assembled in the high bay waiting to receive its three Raptor engines, a nose cone and aero surfaces. A great render there by Corey, beautiful work as always. Check him out on Twitter if you aren't following there. This we don't think will come though until after additional data is gathered via the upcoming SN7.1 test tank has had its run. This test tank follows on from SN7 which was also a test tank and it was pushed to its bursting point on purpose to see what pressure it would take. SN7.1 consists of a forward dome, an aft dome and also a new thrust puck design and skirt all made from the newer 304L series stainless steel. This test vessel is to provide further vital data that is going to be helpful as SpaceX proceeds with the next generation of Starship prototype including serial number 8. If SpaceX can get solid diagnostic information around the maximum pressure that the 304L stainless steel tank and the new thrust puck can withstand before bursting, that would be invaluable. Now, soon after SN6's flight, it was lifted up by a crane, the legs were removed and the prototype was placed onto the roll lift. In the images here by Mary, we can see that three of the six legs were badly damaged during that landing. It also appears that one of the legs didn't even really manage to touch the ground. This isn't really a big deal and somewhat expected due to SN6's offset Raptor engine. Because that engine is not mounted right in the center of the vessel, it needs to fly at a slight angle to stay stable, meaning that SpaceX also needs to land it at a slight angle. This all just makes it a bit of a strange uneven landing. After a few preliminary inspections, it was then rolled back to the production facility for repairs. As always, beautiful footage there of this massive tank rolling up the road and once back at the production site it was just awesome seeing SN5, SN6 and SN8 all there together in the one shot. We'll very soon have a few more prototypes there standing at attention in the shipyard waiting for their turn to fly. So yes, while SN6 undergoes its repairs and after SN7.1 completed its tests, SN5 is then likely to once again complete another hop test which we assume will be another 150 meter test flight. Before that happens of course, SN5 would need to undergo another cross test and static fire to verify that the vehicle didn't sustain any unknown damage that couldn't be seen during its inspections. Now over the last week we've had a little more time to reflect on the flight for serial number 6 and on closer inspection there are some interesting things to note. Firstly SN6 seemed to leap off the pad just a little quicker and kick off that power slide more gracefully than SN5. SN5's flight drifted over the launch stand at a pretty close range and because of this something did explode or get kicked up there with that debris there flying up into the air. SN6 seemed to have mitigated this issue partly by rising vertically sooner before coming over the top of the stand. This seems to have partially resulted in the launch platform sparing a little damage from the worst of the rocket exhaust blast. What's also been noticed is that there was a lack of reaction control system corrections in SN6's flight. With the off-center direction of thrust, no noticeable RCS corrections and a pretty strong wind blowing that day, it's very impressive to see how it was able to maintain such great stability. In SN6's hop, the vehicle ended up turning roughly 60 degrees clockwise before it touched down steadily. SN5's hop on the other hand instead turned roughly 90 degrees counterclockwise, which is why both vehicles leaned two different directions after their landings. Looking at the SpaceX footage from inside the skirt, there seems to be some sort of venting on the right side of the engine, roughly where the small fire appeared on SN5. SN6 certainly didn't have any issues with engine fire, so there again it looks to be an improvement. What did you think of the flight though? Did you see anything out of the ordinary or something that we haven't talked about in enough depth, let me know so we can perhaps include it in a future video. 
On to some construction news, some updates to Starship Prototype's build progress with a forward dome sleeved with a stack of four rings on Tuesday. This is interesting because ever since serial number three, the forward domes have always been sleeved with three ring stacks. This four ring stack is for serial number 10 as shown by the label on the stack. We're thinking that because prototypes from SN8 onwards will always have nose cones and aero surfaces, they must be changing the build process just a little to simplify things. Previously, this section of the vehicle was made up of three separate stacks hand welded together. Maybe they're just simplifying this to reduce the number of sections that require stacking and hand welding. A few out there believe that this could in fact have been the start of a super heavy prototype, but currently haven't seen any good evidence to support that. We'll be watching this one closely over the next few weeks. The super heavy high bay work continues furiously as well. More good progress on that during the week with trussing for the roof going up as well. Not too far to go now until this huge structure is ready for use. Along with all of that, shots here of SN11's aft dome sleeve. That's right, SN11 already. We know that this is for SN11 as there is a handy label on the side saying aft dome and SN11. Those heat shield tile studs can also be seen here on the side of the stack, which is the first time that they've been placed on this section of the Starship. Is it possible the SN11 will be receiving a heat shield on the whole windward side? We're going to soon find out. Also at the build site, a suspected Starship aero cover was sighted by Mary. This is the part that aerodynamically blends fins with the vehicle's body. Brendan's diagram here shows the placement of these pieces relative to the entire vehicle. Now some updates to future testing opportunities. Cameron County has posted two primary road closure dates for the 14th and 17th of September from 9pm to 6am with several backup dates for each. You may notice here that SpaceX has now returned to a series of nighttime tests. The beach at Boca Chica has been closed for the past couple of months due to the pandemic, so closing the road during the day didn't cause too much disruption as it doesn't lead anywhere apart from the beach. However, the beach has now been reopened to the public and therefore there will be much more traffic during the day. Closing the roads all day would cause an annoyance for the public who want to use the beach. Along with all of that, the stand at Pad B with a thrust simulator installed is still being worked on with a lot of effort going into fuel lines that will feed the future prototypes. SN7.1 sat patiently there waiting to be stacked onto the stand and itself being prepared for its test. On Thursday night, the tank was filled with liquid nitrogen to check for any leaks. Pressure would have been kept to a minimum at this point before the real tests begin. The road was closed just after 10 p.m. and frost started appearing around an hour later. Overnight, SN 7.1 was then lifted and placed on the new test stand where it will be tested to a hopefully record-breaking pressure. It will then be tested with the thrust simulator rams to verify the tank construction methods. This will hopefully occur during the next closure date on the 14th. The third, much larger stand intended for orbital flights is now over halfway through constructing the supports for its structure. We're very interested, of course, in what sort of flame diversion system will evolve underneath all of this. A system that diverts the flames in one direction seems logical, but we'll need to see what evidence comes to light as it evolves. So yes, as always, lots going on at Boca Chica. Huge thanks to the amazing Mary providing this material here with NASA Spaceflight, along with RGV aerial photography from the air and Lab Padre's 24-7 live streams. Just as important, Importantly though, thank you to all of you as well for subscribing and liking these videos. I had what seemed a stupidly optimistic goal of reaching 200,000 subscribers before October and wow, if you guys come to the party with that one, getting real close now, you all blow my mind every week. Thank you so much. Now, although we talked briefly about SpaceX's launch of another Starlink mission last week, there was so much other activity to cover that we didn't really get to dive into some of the finer details that I think are quite interesting. For the first time, it was announced that SpaceX completed tests with two Starlink satellites that were equipped with inter-satellite links. We'll talk more about that in a moment, but real quick, this video has been sponsored by Squarespace, which is an all-in-one platform to build your online presence to promote yourself or your business. It is so simple to get started with loads of templates that will get you off the ground quickly in a style that suits your brand. It doesn't matter if you're building a simple portfolio site to showcase your work history, a blog, online store, or anything in between. You'll find the necessary tools that lets you get up and running super quickly. A great feature that I've been finding useful is the email campaign systems included that allows you to effectively accumulate and communicate with your followers. Just like with the website tools offered, there is also an email layout for any audience that you could imagine to get you started. If you want to check it out for yourself, just head to squarespace.com slash Marcus House and save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. You'll find that link in the description below. 
So yes, for the first time it was announced that SpaceX completed tests with two Starlink satellites that were equipped with inter-satellite links. Any satellite in SpaceX's constellation that has this technology will essentially be communicating via space lasers. This form of laser communication, if successful, is quite incredible stuff. The satellites can in theory transfer hundreds of gigabytes of data rapidly to each other, which will add the option of more efficient routes from one ground location to another. In last week's live stream, it was mentioned that the test did involve sending hundreds of gigabytes in a test, but didn't say what speed that was transferred at, so watch out for more information there as it comes to light. Prior to this announcement, as far as we know, they have only ever tested using the regular satellite to ground relay capability. Now that is perfectly adequate when you need to connect a user in a poor connected area with a nearby ground station with high speed. However, not so much if you need to transport that data a much greater distance as fast as possible. This is where the inter-satellite links become super important. Now I've talked about the videos by Mark Handley here before where he expertly demonstrates how relays of different types could work here for Starlink. These videos are a little dated now but the principles around this are still very valid. The reason why Starlink is such a game changer for those with poor connectivity locations is that this has the capability to be faster than current fibre in many circumstances. The greater the distance in communication, the more benefit a constellation like Starlink could have. Firstly, all this data is travelling around very close to the speed of light in a vacuum. Now, most estimates that quote speed differences state that light travels around 31% slower in fibre optic networks than in a complete vacuum. Yes, this can apparently vary depending on the grade of fibre. There's plenty of stories out there suggesting that it's possible for some new fibre technology to have capabilities of signals travelling at over 90% the speed of light in a vacuum. However, that is not what the world currently runs on, so we need to compare current technology here. With the inefficiencies present in current fibre optic cables that run around the world, simple routing from, say, Australia to the United States can be extremely lengthy in ping time, in many cases in excess of 250 milliseconds. Now, depending on the layout of the constellation in the future, it may actually work out better using a combination of ground relays and lasers for the most optimal route, depending on the destination. Some of the great work here shown by Mark demonstrates how this could happen. With any scenario where a satellite may not have access to a ground station, it could instead hand off that data over Laserlink to the appropriate satellite which can then decide to again pass it on or relay back to the ground. This would make connection dropout scenarios near impossible as there would always be some way to route that data even if ground stations were hard to come by in certain areas. One thing is for sure though, it's going to be extremely exciting to see the network roll out to public beta tests to see how dramatically this changes the lives for those that live within poorly served areas. Areas. I'm interested to know what you think of this upcoming possibility with Starlink if you're living in such a location. Let me know your thoughts in the comments. Speaking of Falcon 9 launches, SpaceX released some much higher quality video of the SOCOM 1B booster launch and landing during the week. It's always wonderful to be able to get that higher quality video from SpaceX directly, and especially because this was such a jaw-dropping shot of it breaking through the cloud layer, giving a real sense of speed of the booster as it made its way back to the pad. This was the fourth flight for that booster core, so really nice to see how smooth that landing looked. Now last week we covered the latest Rocket Lab launch named I Can't Believe It's Not Optical. More recently however, Rocket Lab live streamed a video showing off their first ever photon satellite in orbit. This is a spacecraft designed in-house by Rocket Lab and this takes them from being not only a launch provider but now a company that can offer satellite and spacecraft components with on-orbit operation capability. So yes, as explained by Peter Beck in the photon live stream, Mission 14 was a very important one, not only because it was a return to flight after the previous failure of Flight 13, but because after this mission a special command was sent to the kick stage which turned this into Rocket Lab's very first satellite. Also some pretty awesome shots here that were presented on the live stream captured by the camera that's on board. Although the announcement of the Photon was made over a year ago, seeing it in action for the first time we think is very exciting. This is another small step on the way for Rocket Lab to create much more interesting missions of their own. Hopefully in the near future to the moon, and as hinted a few times now Venus, which seems to hold a key interest for Peter Beck. Now one of the more interesting things said here is when he described launching rockets as a means to an end, and he was being brutally honest, calling it a pain in the butt. Now where the real value is, is created in the actual on-orbit mission itself. The data gathered and the resulting systems that people like us can connect to and enjoy. The cheaper and more cost effective it is for any company to send their instruments to orbit, the more innovation is going to occur. This is the main goal of Photon. Systems
systems such as propulsion are typically a major issue for small satellite developers along with energy generation, avionics, high precision attitude control and of course communication systems. With Photon these systems can be built in house leaving the satellite manufacturers to deal just with what matters most to them, the instrument itself. It's, it's going to be great to see Rocket Lab's clients take advantage of that technology for their missions no matter if it's just a low earth orbit mission or beyond. A few quick space launch system announcements with NASA recently completing a successful full-scale booster ground test at the Northrop Grumman facility in Utah. This is quite unique because the five-segment booster is one segment larger than the ones used with the space shuttle and it's now the largest solid rocket booster in the world. It was pieced together between April and June in order to test new propellant ingredients as well as gathering vital data to improve on existing processes, burning for approximately 122 seconds and producing 3.6 million pounds of thrust, this beast is around 46 and a half meters long excluding the nose cone assembly and it is 12 feet or 3.65 meters in diameter. Two of these SRBs will provide up to 75% of the thrust needed to launch the Orion capsule into space and send crew to the moon by 2024 as part of Artemis's mission. The actual Artemis 1 boosters are in preparation for flight at NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida, while the SLS main core continues to undergo its green run testing with the final step hopefully being in late October. This should have us witnessing a hot fire test where all four RS-25 engines will be ignited and will run for approximately 8 minutes. The RS-25 engines will be qualified to run at 109% thrust compared to the Space Shuttle's 104.5%. At liftoff, the SLS configuration will provide 8.4 million pounds of thrust which is even greater than the Saturn V rocket. The uncrewed Orion launch estimated to happen in November 2021 will head off on a three week mission taking the capsule on the deepest space mission to date at approximately 70,000 kilometers beyond the moon. It will then return to Earth faster than the previous four and a half hour exploration flight test in December 2014 which was launched on United Launch Alliance's Delta IV Heavy. So yes there is plenty more news to come from this exciting launch system for anyone that would like to get a little more insight on how all of the SLS components come together, here is a quick summary of the entire SLS launch vehicle courtesy of NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center. I highly recommend checking out the full video there which I've got linked in the description. It beautifully shows examples of each of those components coming together. It sure is going to be great seeing the space launch system fully constructed ready for the test flight. Now some more fresh breaking news on Astra who launched their rocket 3.1 which is designed as a rapidly created two stage rocket small enough to fit into a standard shipping container that aims to lower the cost of small satellite access to space. Very similar I guess to Rocket Lab. Now this was launched from their site in Alaska. It's got five electric pump fed engines and a single upper stage engine which in this flight sadly didn't even get a chance. It appears that the main engine cut off at around 30 seconds into the flight with the rocket plumbing down and exploding nearby on the ground around 40 seconds later. Check out the news feeds for more information as it emerges. At this time of publishing it was still unclear what happened to it but Elon Musk was quick to reply here saying that he is sure that they will figure it out and that it took the first Falcon 4 launches to reach orbit and that rockets are hard. Good luck to Astra for the next flight test. Now just quickly a huge thank you to my amazing patrons here, I simply can't do what I'm doing here without you. Your generous support has allowed me to increase the time I can spend on this content and I can't thank all of you enough for that. Further help just allows me to do even more. If you like what I do and would like to join our awesome patrons head here to patreon.com slash Marcus House. You can interact with me more directly via the included roles in Discord, you can check out some exclusive patron only content and you can also of course have your name listed right up here with all of these other amazing people, people that make all of this possible. Of course with bots always watching to see engagement statistics that is where all of you come in. This is where I need to ask you to do these frustrating things, to like, to leave a comment, to share on whatever social platform you enjoy and subscribe. Uh, and of course hit the bell thing which as far as I can tell still doesn't let me contact all of my subscribers when a video is released. That algorithm is always watching and it simply won't show other people the videos unless you guys do this stuff. That is what this algorithm reduces us all to. Thanks so much though for your help in getting these videos out there. A massive thank you as well to my quality control squad here for helping me research and proof the material for these videos. If you're interested in these topics and would like to be a part of this follow me on Twitter and please do 
get in touch. In the tile in the bottom left today, we have my video last week talking about SOCOM 1B, Starlink, SN6's hop, and much more. In the top right is my latest video, and in the bottom right, content that YouTube has selected from a channel just for you. Thank you, as always, everyone, for watching, and we'll see you all in the next video.